someone once told me if you can tickle your own foot then that means you're a psycho and i can tickle my own foot and i've been genuinely worried about that for a long time i, I wouldn't i don't think that's true the good the bad and the science comedians and scientists good the bad and the science welcome to the good the bad and the science the show that breaks down the science of television and movies with a comedian and a scientist today we're discussing the invention of lying so i'll ask about deception exaggeration and how to become a better liar Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Ethan Edinburgh, and I've got two wonderful guests joining me today. My first guest is a stand-up comedian and writer. Welcome to the show, Jackie Brown. Hey, everybody. How's it going, Jackie? Really good, thanks. It was a good excuse to rewatch. I haven't, I've seen the movie, but it's been years, so it was a good excuse to rewatch the movie. It's really funny. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for doing that for us. Um, and same, by the way, I had seen it once before, so we're on the same page everything's cool. We're not starting out with vicious arguments. So that's a plus. Um, <laughs> would you say that you're a good liar? Me a good liar? Oh, yeah. I could lie right now and say no. <laughs> that's no. true. I mean, I wouldn't know. You know, I feel like I'm not. But if it's like to make someone feel better, I think in the moment I can fudge a lie if it would make sense. Okay. But not like in a bad way, like a white lie, I guess. Yeah, so you, you have experience uh, in, in telling some white lies in a good way. You're trying to help people out with your lying. Sure. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, our second guest uh, has been on once before. He discussed Tarzan with me. He is a cognitive scientist. He's a professor and vice chair uh, of the Department of Communication at UCLA. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Greg Bryant. Thank you. Um, I again also I didn't hear most of what you just said. Sorry. Most of what I said was insults. I was just um, <laughs> I could I could yeah, tell I was that. Just yeah. Really pissed off that you're back on the show. Yeah. Um, I had one question before we dive into lying and this movie because I was looking at papers that you've published and one of them was the sound of arousal in music is context dependent. Could you tell me what that was all about? <laughs> yeah. Um, Sure. So that was a study I did with uh, my colleague, Dan Blumstein, who is in ecology and evolutionary biology. He studies marmots, which are these um, sort of large ground squirrel looking animals in, that live in the mountains in Colorado and other places. And uh, he's interested in, in screaming marmots, basically the vocalizations they make that are um, different kinds of uh, like alarm signals that they produce. And so he got interested in how this might relate to sounds in music that have similar characteristics to screams and marmots, which is they're distorted and they have these particular acoustic features that are technical. I don't need to get into, but basically it's the sounds of distortion and um, it's related to arousal when you blow air through a vocal tract, which is the space between your throat and your mouth, then um, if you blow it too hard, like similarly, if you turn the stereo up and you blow the speaker out, it distorts because um, it can't handle the energy that's going through it. And so you get these same features in music as you do in screaming animals, including screaming people. And so we, um, we created some music that um, it had distortion or not that was modeled sort of in the same way as you could uh, model distortion in animal vocalizations. And then we had people listen to them and rate them for arousal and um, emotional valence, positive or negative. And we found that people found distorted um, versions of these elevator songs that we made. Elevator music, really boring, but then it kind of has these distorted parts, you know. And when those parts came in, people thought they were more negative and thought they were more arousing. So the idea is that the same kind of psychology that we bring to bear on hearing vocalizations in animals we also use when we're listening to music that it kind of triggers those same mechanisms hmm. that's, that's about the size of it wildly interesting and now if i made a band and went on tour and called ourselves the screaming marmots would i have to pay you like ip or how does um, that work well i think we could probably come with it into a settlement mm-hmm Great. I'll have okay, to get good. Dan on the phone and see. 
Oh, yeah, obviously ask Dan. I don't want to step on his shoes either. Um, he's the marmot guy. He's the marmot. Yeah, yeah, you're not a freak like him. I'm not a marmot guy. Yeah, no, of course not. I would never make I that mean, assumption. I love them. They're fine. Okay, so, yeah, we are discussing, y'all, the invention of lying. It's a movie from 2009, and I forgot. The first thing that stuck out to me was the cast. The cast is, like, remarkable in this movie. I had to mention it. So... Yeah, I was I was asking Greg if you th- if if it stuck out to you that instead of just you know being honest, people were really dishing out their intimate thoughts. People throughout the movie were just you know being very blunt about every single thing that came into their head, and I wanted to know what you thought about that in relation to lying. So. I mean, that was the first thing I noticed, and, and it was kind of the assumption: if we don't lie, then we have to say everything we think, mm-hmm. which obviously is not true, right? So, um, it was people are then mean to each other, essentially, but then they all seem to have a flat affect about it, like they're just used to it because everybody just always does that. Mm-hmm. That seemed to be the assumption. But yeah, I did point out the idea that um, I mean, there's there's overt lying where you say something that you don't think is true and you're trying to convince somebody else is true. And then there's lying by omission, which is you don't tell somebody something that they would expect you to tell them. And then by omitting it, you're deceiving them. And then there's just saying everything you think, which means that there's no thing that you're thinking that you don't reveal. Mm -hmm. That seemed to be part of their world. But there's no way that could actually happen. We think so many things, we can't even verbalize what we think. Right. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, not telling everybody everything is not really deception, but that I, seems to be the way they... I've definitely heard from an ex years ago, well, you didn't ask me, so is it really lying? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> I mean, it could be, that could be an honest thing if it's a little thing where it's like, I didn't even occur to me that you would want to know, you know, what I did, right, with, yeah. whatever. But it's like, oh, you didn't ask me if I was sleeping with other people. No, I mean, whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. I like that, that very like clinical labeling of it though, to say lying by omission sounds really nice and, and accurate, you know, like there's no wishy-washiness about that it's just that is what it is you're lying by omission right i mean it's all about intentions which is the you know the the core of deception is about your intention Mm -hmm. so you intend to spread information in a way that benefits you presumably or somebody around you which indirectly benefits you um, or cost another person which could be like you might spread a lie about somebody and that will cause their reputation to suffer which then could benefit maybe one of their competitors that's your colleague or your collaborator whatever Mm -hmm. so there could be lots of different ways that you manipulate information and you intend to do it which is different than if you say something you think is true and you tell another person it turns out to be false you know that's not a lie but people sometimes will say you lied and it's like no i thought that was correct um, and so they mistake the idea that you, there's misinformation for deception. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Do you, can you spot when someone is lying, Greg, easier because you've studied this kind of stuff because I like to play poker and it's important to me to be able to tell when I think someone is telling the truth or not. And I had looked up this morning, some signs that people are lying. I don't know how legit they are, but I kind of wanted your take on it. And then I wanted to like, run down some of these like run them by you sure so uh, personally i probably better than the average bear but I'm, i don't think i'm some deception detecting genius or anything but i think i'm i'm pretty probably pretty good at it but okay. i also do know some of the signs and there are um, mostly facial and body signs less vocal I'm, i study vocal communication a lot mm-hmm. and there aren't a lot of reliable vocal cues i mean unless there's some really obvious ones but that's you know, if you if you reveal that you're nervous, that can come through in your voice. But right. um, those are the most subtle cues, and the more obvious ones are in the face. Okay, so the rookie stuff comes out in our words, and and you've got some some facial and and body stuff. So I want to I want to know about that because I, I most of the stuff that I have is like how people talk. Right. 
No, well, that's a huge one too. Okay. Um, in t including kids. So sometimes when you, um, people have to interview kids for court cases um, in various ways, and Whoa. they can tell if the kids are lying by the by their language use. And there's actually software that's been programmed to analyze text and then wow. can, de can detect pretty well whether kids are lying. It has to do with the way they use certain words and repetitions and the, the, the way that they um, share details, which is also true in adults in a lot of the ways. Um, when people lie, they, they provide less details. Right. Um, there's some other, there's some other stuff in text, but so, yeah. So shoot, what, what are some of the things that you were? Okay. About? Well, I want to get first, I want some, some details on the facial stuff, because again, I'm sitting at the poker table, some mother effers not saying anything, but I got to be able to, to read him. So what about the like looking stuff? I've heard, you know, rumors or whatever about people oh if they look up while they're talking or if they look down or if they look to the side like is that a, is that a tick is that a tail that would be a, i think a pretty subtle one um I, when people are talking to you whether they look you in the eye or not that's going to be something so if they're oh. averting your direct gaze that's definitely an indicator that means they're, they are potentially doing up to something okay. um there's also what are called micro expressions which are these uncontrollable very um subtle tiny movements in your muscles, like around your eyes and around your mouth. Mm -hmm. And so if you see like little tiny little shakes um, in micro expressions that can indicate that they're trying to manipulate their facial Whoa. muscles in a way that's maybe different from their more automatic system that is controlling your facial muscles. And that causes these little flitter flutters. And okay. so these micro expressions are actually one of the most revealing things. And so um, again, there is software that does this too. This guy, Paul Ekman, who is the subject of the show Lie to Me, mm -hmm. which you might have heard of. Sure. Paul Ekman is a real researcher who's studied deception and facial expressions. And um, so the show is is basically kind of, um, it's like he, he, the character is based on him. And um, he, he's really good at detecting these things in video. He can identify immediately all the little, and he can control his face too. He's kind of a freak about ability to control his facial expressions. Damn. But um, yeah, he's a retired psychologist now, but he's, he's still with us. But um, yeah, micro expressions are a big one. That's one thing he's always pointed out. When I get stressed out, my eyes twitch. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes right. I get a little, so I hope I'm not like put on the stand and I'm like, that happens to me, my leg. Well, that's the idea actually, you, exactly, is that, that you're under stress because there's a, when you're lying, you're at risk of being uncovered and that could be well, what if that. I'm stressed that somehow I get framed for something I didn't do? Well, then... totally. So there are differences between those kinds of things. I mean, so this is what a lie, detect <laughs> a lie detecting test is actually the same kind of thing, a polygraph, where you could be nervous that you're getting caught in the lie or you be nervous that you nervous think you're lying. Thing. Yeah. And sure. You're not. That signature in the polygraph looks different than when you actually lie. Which oh, really? Nice. Okay. Oh. Phew. So, yeah, so you should you're be right. Good. They could be confused, you know, and so. Yeah, I don't know who is like continuously accusing you of stuff, Jackie, but that sounds really interesting. No, it's just fun to make up like non-existing scenarios that could never probably happen. But <laughs> what I would do in those situations and then worrying about them, that's. Yeah, the natural spiral of our brains to be like, OK, but what if I'm on trial for something I didn't do and my eye twitches? Well, exactly. the more you worry about it, then the less likely you will end up on trial because you're going to be careful. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so yeah, one of the things I found was somebody not, uh, like, being less personal is a good way to summarize it. Like, excluding the word I or me from a situation, it could mean that they're lying because it, like, somehow distances themselves from the lie, themselves from the lie. So, like, instead of saying, I don't know him, They'll say something like, that doesn't ring a bell. Or, you know, no, never seen him before or something like that. Like, without saying I in there. Does that, is that accurate? Is that, is that crazy talk, psycho talk? I wouldn't say it's crazy. I don't know data that, that I have done, I'm not aware of research that shows that. But um, there, there is um, um, different kind of research looking at the way we use pronoun like I and self-reference and how it relates to different personality characteristics and things like that. So it wouldn't surprise me if something like that's true. 
Okay. Uh, here's another one. Being overly negative about the situation. So instead of saying, my laptop died, they would say, oh, my stupid laptop died. I hate that damn laptop. And so that their laptop didn't really la- die? Correct. Yeah, they're lying in that second situation, I guess. I mean, that doesn't seem out of bounds to me. I mean, all these things are, are you know, require study. And so mm-hmm. things that intuitively might seem to be correct are could easily not be. And things that seem fucking nuts might be true. Mm-hmm. So that seems reasonable to me, actually. Okay, great. Uh, the third one you actually mentioned already, which is keeping the lie simple. Uh, since it's harder, I guess, for our brains to make up and keep straight, you know, an elaborate series of events. Right. Right. Okay. And you have to remember who you told the lie to. Sure. Right. So then you all of a sudden oh. you have a network of people that you have to keep <laughs> track of. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And so <laughs> people are slower in like reaction time experiments and other kinds of things. They're noticeably slower in producing responses. And so there's a, and a lot, all this yeah. stuff is like companies want these kind of data so they can make a product that detects mm-hmm. detect deception. I know some people that work on things like that. And so um, a reaction time test is actually pretty reliable. If people just take like a quarter of a second longer to answer a question reliably, then that maybe means that they're lying. Or stoned. <laughs> or what? Or stoned. Right. And so you could play it off like I'm just a slow all, all the time around. Yeah. Oh, so that's good advice for you, Jackie, if you're put on the stand to just act like you're high and that way they don't know. Perfect. Yeah. I just, I just hope I like don't smoke weed. So I hope they don't ask me any questions about it because I'll sound like <laughs> a cop or something. Yeah, I don't smoke pot. Like, no. I, I did marijuanas earlier this morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lying. Hell, something's up with this girl. Maybe she did murder those people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you can just pretend you're stupid. That'll help. Easy. Yeah, yeah. That's no problem. Um, so the last one is just complicated language. It's like overly, unnecessarily complex vocabulary, etc. And I have a quote from Nixon that I thought was funny because he said, I can say categorically that this investigation indicates that no one on the White House staff, no one presently employed, was involved in this very bizarre incident. And without providing specific episodic details right there's no details about the episode or any other thing it's just you kind of are saying too many words yeah i think that's why and it's like unfortunate now looking back but people are anti-politicians is because they feel the need to like appear professional and use a bunch of complex language and then we hear that and go this guy's full of crap I can't believe anything they're saying. And then we gravitate gravitate towards the guy we want to have a beer with who ends up being a complete schmuck. Or worse. Or worse. (laughs) A huge criminal piece of shit. (laughs) Oh, man. I mean, there's another thing that's an interesting component related to all this is that um, there are a certain segment of this population that are psychopaths. And And I mean that in the technical sense of having psychopathy, meaning that they can actually avert, avoid all of these um, cues of lying because they um, are, they have no internal um, emotions that are affecting their behavior. Mm-hmm. So they don't give a shit, right? All they need, they're just manipulative. And so um, they don't produce the little micro expressions. They don't speak differently necessarily. They are really good at social manipulation. Um, and so those are the, that's kind of a dangerous, you know, um, sub type of people. I mean, there's, you know, like five to 10% of the population have these characteristics. Mm, that's it's a huge thought it would be. Yeah. It's what same. we call subclinical psychopathy, which is it, where you're not a complete psychopath, but you have psychopathic traits. Mm, psychopath adjacent. Kind of, yeah. It's like uh, psychopath really light. For it. Yeah. yeah. It's like less psychopath, but still an asshole. <laughs> a sprinkle of psycho. Yeah, just sprinkle a little psychopath in there. In fact, actually, we all have psychopathic traits to some extent because we're social actors manipulating in a in a social sure. ecology, and so you know, there's right. we're all doing manipulation at some level, right? It's not necessarily um, malignant. It's not designed to hurt people, but we're all social actors, mm-hmm. and so. 
you push some of these things a little bit to the boundary and then it starts getting, you know, to be a little more selfish and a little more what most people would consider not right. Someone, yeah. someone once told me if you can tickle your own foot, then that means you're a psycho and I can tickle my own foot. And I've been genuinely worried about that for a long time. I, I wouldn't, I don't think that's true. Okay, good. Wow. <laughs> So we're we're solving one of your lifelong fears today on the program. God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can Venmo me a couple hundred bucks for that. But. Wow, <laughs> could have just done a good deed there for free, but <laughs> wants to charge you two hundred dollars. It's a lot of money. Um, and also maybe put your friend on blast. Whoever told you that that person's a psycho. Yeah, actually, maybe they are. A psycho. <laughs> yeah. What about um, uh, um, the compulsive lying or compulsive liars? Is that getting into the psychopath territory or is that something else? I'd say the compulsive liars are, um, you know, it's one of those things where it's one particular kind of trait, the social behavioral trait just kind of goes off the rails and it's usually not going to be good to do it too much. Anything, you, everything in moderation, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, it, there could be something specific about the strategy of deception, which we all engage in some level, right? Even if it's like white lies or whatever. Um, and then you just are on the extreme on that particular trait. And so okay. probably mostly um, costly to be a compulsive liar. Otherwise, we'd all do it more. It makes me think about, have you ever met someone who lies about things they don't even need to lie about? Right. And you know that totally. they're lying. You're like, why did you, you didn't even need to lie about that? Is that on the same kind of like... Yeah. Subject? I'd say, I mean, it probably depends on the content that they're lying about. And so some people, if, you know, or who they're lying to. So they might do that more when they're trying to impress people or they feel like they're in low social standing, relatively speaking, and they need to like, you know, seem better than they are or, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's strange when people will say things like, there's no reason for you to do that. What? Or even if it's like not even remarkably impressive, you're just like, why didn't you just lie about that? Right. Weird. Like, is it maybe they're just so used to it that it's so easy to lie or it's just like second nature for them? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I mean, listen, Jackie, you're really intimidating. You know, we just met and it's like, I, you know, I could feel myself just lying about everything in order to seem like we're on similar ground. So maybe that's what's going on here. I don't know. Perfect. <laughs> you know. I mean, Gre immediately when I met Greg, I see he's got a, a Moog synthesizer. I'm like, okay, this guy and I are in the same, we're two peas in a pot. I don't, I don't need to pretend I'm anything that I'm not here. Um, <laughs> so it sounds to me, because I, I know the type of people you're talking about also, Jackie, and it is really weird and kind of bothersome because I, I tend to think about it like people just are doing things that are out of their control. Like to me, the word compulsive means they're not, maybe they're not trying to gain anything from it. It's just a kind of uh, automatic trigger response based on stimuli or something. Right, Greg? Yeah, I mean, I would actually argue that none of us are in control of our behavior. Ooh. It just seems like that. Oh, so, shit. And, and so, he's giving me so much relief today. I'm like, <laughs> I am not. <laughs> it's not, exactly. not up to you. Go nuts. It's not your fault. <laughs> All right, I'm going to see you guys later. This has been great. I'm going <laughs> to see ya. Don't give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go rob a liquor store. It's not your fault. Yeah. Um, Got a lot of things to do. It's weird advice that we're getting also from the scientists today. It's strange. Usually it's like really productive, but... I yeah, there's some interesting studies looking at, um, you know, the relationship between when a, a brain system is activated that is related to a behavior and when you actually consciously decide to do a behavior. Mm -hmm. So like they'll say, you know, when you're ready decide to grab the glass and then grab the glass and then people will and, then, and their brain is hooked up to you know different measuring devices and then they decide to grab the glass and then they grab the glass and you can see the brain activity that started the motor movement was before the decision that they verbally report mm. so um it's sort of like our brains are informed by other systems at some level now you're doing this thing but there is um a feet a loop that makes it seem like the decision happened before the action happened. Wow. And yeah, it's pretty crazy stuff. It is that is bonkers stuff. And so, I mean, that doesn't mean that we there's no personal responsibility or that at some level we're not choosing what we do. I mean, in, in, in ways we are aware of our strategic behaviors, but in a, in a lot of ways we are we we feel like we're in control a lot more than we are. 
Um, and another good point for you to bring up on trial, Jackie, is that none of it was, it, you're not in control, you know? Exactly. Listen, Greg Bryant told me that Dr. Greg I Bryant do isn't my fault. So yeah. really who you should be talking to yeah. is my guy. Because of <laughs> the user the illusion. Yeah, the user illusion, they call it, which is a computer science terminology for that thing where the user is uh, has, under the illusion that they're controlling the action of the system. Uh, speaking of bonkers stuff, you mentioned some frequency dependent, what was it? Frequency dependent selection. Yeah. So what the main concept of the movie, I think, um, is that in a world where nobody lies and then you introduce a single liar, they just clean up. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Everybody just takes them at, I mean, when the guy says, you know, I can't remember one of the first things he says is, um, um, it was the drunk drive, the cop. When they got pulled over, uh -huh. he was getting Edward pulled over driving. Yeah. And, and then um, he said, this man is not drunk, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the cop's like, oh, I'm sorry. And then at the bank, I think, or he went and get, was getting some money. And, and, or he was at the casino and he says, I won on this machine. It didn't give me the money. And mm -hmm. they're like, oh, sorry. And then they gave him. The, so, I mean, those are absurd examples. But the idea is that in a world where everybody thinks the truth is the only thing, then you can manipulate them very easily. Right. And so, um but then as, as, as lying evolves and everybody starts lying, then it, it's not so easy to manipulate anybody anymore. And then you can have a situation where then two individuals that decide to not lie with one another can do better than the liars do in a world of all liars. Oh. And so then you have selection for not lying, that cooperation, sincere, sincerity. And then those, those individuals will then spread to the population and then the liars then get back can get back to exploiting truth tellers and so you get this thing where it goes back and forth between you get um the selection for you the liars or non-liars is dependent on the frequency of non-liars or liars in the population wow so maybe that's the movie we got to make actually is is a person that just tells the truth because everybody's lying their asses off right exactly and they find one other truth you got to find somebody who um, mm -hmm. doesn't can also lie. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it's this is a, a principle in animal signaling um, that and, and it applies to deception. And it's called an arm. It's an arms race, basically. It's a co-evolutionary arms race. Uh -huh. And so psychopaths are a, one strategy that they can invade a population of non-psychopaths and do really well. Right. right? And so that's the, that's the niche that they fill um, is by exploiting people who aren't psychopaths. Right. Mm -hmm. And if everybody turns into a psychopath, that strategy won't be so effective anymore. And so there's a stabilizing process selection where they kind of stabilize it being like, a, you know, less than 10 percent of the population. So it's one possible strategy of many strategies. Yeah, I was going to say, can we can we get one of the other strategies? Because I'd love to defeat all these psychopaths that are running the earth, but I don't want to become a psychopath and have all my friends do that. So like, wh how else can we take them down or trap them in a big well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. invite them to a convention, the honest people convention or whatever. And they... Oh, yeah. All right. So they think they're going to clean house and then we burn the building down. Which is probably the most psychopathic thing I've ever said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jesus Christ. Right. No you know? I don't know what but, happened to I me. Mean, <laughs> I mean, you, you're right. I in the back of your head there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go. I need to take a break. The CEOs have been measured as being, um, you know, significantly more psychopathic than the baseline in the population. That's like, there's a couple famous studies showing that. Ugh. Yeah, because it's, it's definitely... Straight you need certain skills or just right. your personality that you'd need to you know hey we have to lay off 500 people from this company who are we going to do choose to do it i wouldn't be good at that that's not like a little pat on my back but like there's yeah. certain people be like yeah i got it what's up like, totally yeah. no it's a cutthroat mentality kind yeah. of low empathy and um dog eat dog psycho and social skills you know you know how to talk to people yeah is that the you think it's a similar thing with politicians as well? Because I feel like there's just not enough like good, decent people in Congress and the Senate. Well, it's kind of a classic thing. It's like anybody that you'd really want to do that is not interested in doing that. Or right. people that are interested in doing it are the ones that shouldn't do it. Right. God damn it. <laughs> also, am I throwing around the word psycho too much? Because it is fun 
for me to say and like call people when they're not expecting it. Like if they order, you know, a latte with coconut milk instead of oat milk for me, that person's a psycho. Is that rude? Am I being rude? You're kind of killing the word psycho. I mean, it's like the difference between, you know, you bury bodies in your backyard and when you order like an oat latte or whatever and they're both psychos, that doesn't seem right. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So I, I, I need a new word for a Dexter style psycho. I need like that. I need to call that something else. Yeah. Yeah. So, There's, I mean, yeah. Lunatic. That seems more light to me though. That's true. Yeah. Lunatic is fun and breezy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So uh, I, I also wanted to mention, I, I don't even know if it's worth mentioning, but advertising kind of in general, they make a few jokes about it in the movie. Um, like that's probably my favorite part of the movie. Actually, is like the I can brown sugar water. Oh god, it's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. And I love how there's just because I, I do think that most commercials should be that where it's just a dude or a, a woman or somebody and and the product and like nothing else going on and just them being like, here's this this is the truth about our what's going on here. You know, it's not healthy for you. It's got loads of sugar. It you know might make you obese, but. Uh, everybody likes it. It's really famous, and uh, <laughs> just keep going. <Coke. laughs> yeah, I'm, we're asking you to keep buying Coke. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I mean, is that like? I don't want to make people feel bad that are in advertising, of course, and I'm sure you know we've all done to some extent some sort of you know uh, you know complimenting a brand to our friends or whatever. But I mean, a lot of advertising is based on let's say bending the truth or exaggerating some portion of that product right the, what's not stated is actually where the deception is right ah. so yeah and so the average the ads are often are true um but then the problem is that they don't tell you the stuff that that uh, you don't want to hear it's actually going on yeah it's like a creative uh omission right yep i mean you know old ads in the 50s were more like that like that ad in the movie in the coke ad i mean not saying the bad stuff but sort of like just a person standing there holding the thing and like here's the product here's the product name here's what it does buy it or whatever mm -hmm. there's the, no pattern, the pattern i noticed with all lying whether it's like if you want to call advertising like coca-cola lying is I feel like there's some sort of level, even if it's minor, of um, like some level of justification mm -hmm. in the lie. And I, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I feel like even with someone advertising Coke, it's like, well, they're, you know, it's not my job if they go over to mount monitor if they overindulge. Like one Coke to enjoy is like, what's the harm in that? Like that's why I can do this because I'm just advertising something that like beyond my control is like up to you what to do with it. So this is why it's okay. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. I guess people are worried about that um, you're using, um, you know, a person who's a celebrity is using their influence in a way that maybe is not the best way to do it. Or is that like you could maybe do other things with that power, but instead you use it selfishly to get paid a lot of money to, to speak for a product that you really don't care about. Mm -hmm. Then there's probably the thing like, I love this product and I, I'm happy to like advertise for it. Oh, and I'm also happy to take the million dollars there and that's the justification like okay well this is a lot right. of like there's right. always like that's a pretty obvious thing to say i feel like but i don't know even with the bad stuff i feel like i, I start yeah. asking like how could someone do that yeah i mean it's i think with sports people that's the the difference between really making it or not is that you get the endorsement deal or whatever right yeah yeah which um, we're open to here on the podcast. If any sport, Adidas wants to, uh, you know, I got to be comfy in, in my shoes while I'm recording podcasts and there's no more comfortable shoes than Adidas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, we're not sponsored by them, but hey, they make great stuff and I do like how sustainable their products are. That is a, a true thing. I might be omitting something messed up, but I know they do a lot of sustainable stuff, so... There's that. Um, and speaking of brands and promoting stuff, we are running short on time. So Jackie Brown, is there something you'd like to tell people about? Some a way people can follow you on the internet, perhaps? Sure. Um, I'm on Instagram 
and TikTok, but I've never posted there. So there, I think there's like one video, but I should probably do it more. But um, both of those are, it's Jackie Brown. That's I-T-S-J-A-C-Q-U-I-E Brown. Got it. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to rewatch this film beyond the show. Uh, it's been a delight to talk to you, even though your mind is so dark and twisted and <laughs> messed up. You asked um, me to do this, okay? Thank you for having me. This is really fun. No, of course. Anytime. And uh, and Dr. Greg, uh, before you, you take off to France, is there something you'd like to, to tell us about? Um, well, I'm releasing an album this week. Hell yeah. Cool. And, um, yeah, that's... Um, kind of a, a weird eclectic uh cross genre mix of music but oh, yeah. it's i'm released under the name g bryant and um, the album is called soft assembly of a diehard and Ooh. uh and yeah so that's that'll be available on itunes and spotify hopefully in the next week and, uh, and then i'll have vinyl available in march it takes we're, there's a vinyl delay now it takes a long time to get a record pressed that's right, but it's worth the wait, people. Get that vinyl, Soft Assembly of a Die Hard. Love that album title. Uh, pretty offended. I mean, you know I'm a musician. I'm not featured on any of these eclectic genre-bending songs, so that's... I know you were a musician, actually. I just learned that. Hmm. Okay, so I yeah. guess have or a I producer forgot. to yell at, then, on my show here. Yeah. Um, he, he said Moog earlier. The synthesizer, so. <laughs> yeah, between then and now, you could have easily <laughs> asked me to join his album. Yeah. Yeah, real Well, rude. it made me wonder because he said Moog, not Moog. Oh, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a poser. You're right. That's my that's on me. <laughs> it's a Moog for sure. Um, thank you both, seriously, for, for joining me on the program. And, uh, and I hope that you're being honest and not lying when you say that you had a good time here as well. I did. I did, and she did, I think, too. My eye starts twitching. <laughs> yeah, no, I had fun. It was really fun. Yeah, uh, fun. <laughs> All right. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.